Hello, everyone, and welcome to Big Mark. It's a little windy here in Chicago, so there may be a few technical glitches, but uh, we are presenting mushrooms. Today, we're going to talk a little about the history and lore of mushrooms, which with the holidays coming upon us so quickly, mushrooms plan, uh, easy play a part in all kinds of meat. The mushroom sauces are stuffed mushrooms or any kind of stews or anything. So it's a, it's a, it's a big part of the holiday uh, celebrations. And the history of it goes back five, six, seven, eight, 10,000 years. There's all kinds of biblical references to it. And China, which is uh, the, actually the largest grower of mushrooms behind the, uh, ahead of the United States, there's a lot of reference in a lot of their old, uh, you know, history. Uh, we, you know, refers to two mushrooms and how they deal with them. And uh, again, it grew very well because they didn't have enough meat. A lot of times, you know, they only had ch chicken. But so much of it was something they added to the stir fries and everything. Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, is considered the uh, the, the uh, mushroom capital of the world. It produces the most freshly cultivated mushrooms each year. Now, the early Romans considered mushrooms to be food of the gods, so they treated them very carefully. And there's some story about if it weren't for fungi, fungi, now fungi is the actual official name, classification name for it. And they say if it weren't for fungi, there might not be any fossil fuels. A truffle is a type of mushroom that grows below the ground and one of the world's most expensive foods. Uh, one variety called the, uh, the, the uh, tube of metasporum can cost between $800 and $1,500 a pound. And most of the Perigord region in France is where the black truffles uh, uh, grow, used around the roots of oak trees. And uh, in Italy, they have uh, a white mushroom. Now, what the difference is, I don't know how they, one's white, one's black, but they do. And they're, they are sought by pigs that are trained, dogs that are trained. And these other guys are experts who can spot this little bug or a fly that sort of hovers around the area of the truffle. And some of the real foragers go out and see that little bug and they know there's a, there's a uh, you know, a truffle somewhere in the area. Now the English believed that the mushroom had to be gathered under a full moon to be edible. So the English are always coming up with weird reasons why they do things. I forget what it was last time we talked about the same thing. The largest uh, living organism of the mushroom variety is a called as a honey mushroom, which covered 3.4 miles of land in the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon, and it's still growing. Now, you had it right, 3.4 square miles of mushroom. So you can imagine what a, uh, what a ragu that would make. Some of the earliest commercial mushroom farms were actually set in the caves of France during the reign of, of, of Louis XIV. So it's a... Uh, you know, it's it's something that has been around for years in great varieties, and you've got to be uh, sort of very uh, aware of how and how to do it. In France, almost in the old days, the people in foraging, they had uh, most of the drugstores, the pharmacies, apothecaries, had somebody who was a mycologist, uh, a specialist in uh, in mushrooms, and he would uh, <coughs> excuse me, my heavens, uh, he would. Um, be able to identify it so nobody nobody get poisoned. You can usually tell from the underside, but I wouldn't play around with it unless you know what you're doing. But it's one of the most uniquely food grown uh, foods grown in the uh, in this in the second in the supermarket. Uh, shedding light on what's grown in the dark. That's where they're grown. It's in the dark, so sort of a moist atmosphere. That's why in the forest and stuff where they have a lot of pine needles, they usually spring or fall and you have a lot of moisture in the ground, uh, that's when they'll sort of puff up. They have no chlorophyll co containment themselves. So as a result, what they have to do is, uh, is, 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 is they can't use photosynthesis, which is what all other green plants do, uh, the only trees and anything else. So they now, uh, they had good, uh, they've grown in organic uh, uh, material, which, It'd be, you know, corn cobs or all kinds of things that the people do refuge, refuse refuge, and they cr create and they make a special, a special mushroom bed, and they take the uh, the nu nutrients from the, from this growing medium, which is the compost, and it's sort of, uh, you know, cotton seed, cotton shells, uh, nitrogen supplements, and the initial 
seeding takes about seven to 14 days. And they'll sort of, uh, you know, like a little button will uh, start, start to come up. And that's what they call spawning. And that's a plant with roots and, uh, and, and stuff. But the, these people do not have plants with roots. They have little thread-like cells called mycelium. And in order to propagate the compost, the mushroom roots uh, growers use spawn grain, a seed that is inoculated with, a, with mushroom spores. And they transfer the, the, the mycelium to the beds and the time needed for the spawn to do it is about 14 to 21 days. So then they have a case in which they call is made of peat moss and they put that over at a certain point. This is all again in the dark, there's no light and some white little uh, Protrusions will, will come on the uh, on on the uh, on the top of the bed and push with like little uh, small buttons and, and then they call those pins and they grow into larger and eventually into you know, larger mushrooms and depending on the sizes when you decide to pick them and that's about eighteen to twenty one days so they're harvested through the, the sixteen to thirty five day cycle it takes about fifteen weeks to complete the growing. And they're they're you know they're you know set out and refrigerated and that's uh, you know they last sometimes the whole trip to market from the beginning is takes about four months, and when they're through with it, in the special room that each each uh, uh, group or each uh, you know section uh, uh, time period it is, they go in and they totally sterilize the whole room, clean it out, blow it out. And then start all all over again. So that's the history from the lore of, uh, of of mushrooms. And as I say, I would next time I'm going to get into into the all, all the different kinds. You know, you know whether I talk about seeps, uh, uh, you know, all the money oyster mushrooms and enoki. Uh, there's all different you know kinds of uh, mushrooms, and we'll go into some of those. So. Try your mushrooms again. We remember a long time we talked about this. You don't you buy them in cellophane packages in your refrigerator. You don't open the cellophane up. The best way to keep the mushrooms is you have a little bit of a brown paper bag. They put them in, take them out of the box you bought them in, and put them in a brown paper bag, and they'll last much longer because they have air in there. They're almost like a breathing entity on their own. So you don't want to smother them, which you'll do if you don't take the plastic out. So Go ahead, march to the mushroom beat next couple of weeks. All right, uh, I've been on mute uh, because there's been every possible uh, auditory intrusion imaginable uh, while you were discussing mushrooms, but uh, our faithful audience did not have to suffer through them. Uh, so there we are. Um, it sounds like we're gonna do one more before Christmas, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, wines for the holiday because this is basically the time where you'll be going out and buying them. We are going to be enjoying this bottle of Chateau Gabi 2014, which uh, my cousin Tommy makes in Bordeaux, or his winemaker does. And we are lucky enough to have a few bottles of it. So that's that will be our wine and I our our entree is as yet undetermined, although I think we're gonna start the day with some smoked sturgeon, which they have at a nice price at Whole Foods right now, and I love sturgeon. Um, but uh, thinking about your, uh, your Christmas uh, delicacies and what you might enjoy with them wine-wise, you know, starting sequentially, uh, traditionally, uh, up until the last few years, uh, we've always had our lobster sandwiches Christmas morning, well, our traditional accompaniment to that is half eggnog and half skim milk, and then coffee for Sean and I. Uh, we, uh, if we were to do an alcohol pairing, uh, I would either want to do um, some sort of sparkling, and I'm um, going to be talking about a fair number of Spanish options. So, uh, cava would be great. You know, it's Christmas, so if you want to spring for champagne, that's awesome, but there's some really um, terrific cabas, or if you wanted to go Italian, you could get Franciacorta, which is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay based, just like your wines from Champagne. If you wanted to do something non-sparkling, I was thinking Gewürztraminer would be really good because you get that kind of lychee character and uh, you know, whether you did a, a, a pretty dry Gewürztraminer or a little bit sweeter one, you know, perhaps a, a Gewürztraminer from Alsace, which tends to be on the drier side would be 
a lovely accompaniment. <laughs> Um, it sounds like I have to talk fast. All right, we're gonna move to dinner. If you're doing ham, I recommend Riesling, especially an off dry one, which will be delightful with whatever kind of glaze you have going on. And if you wanna do a red wine for your ham, um, anything Grenache based. So Garnacha is the same as Grenache, it's just produced in Spain. So you could do a, uh, a Spanish Garnacha, or you could do a Chateauneuf de Pop, which tends to be Grenache dominated along with the 12 other varietals in there. And if you wanted to uh, do something a little bit richer, like uh, you know, filet, you know, any kind of uh, rich red meat, uh, you can still stay within the Spanish uh, rubric because of course, Rioja. And you know, if you're having a, you know, something with a char on it, you're gonna probably want a, uh, you know, a reserva, you know, not, not the, the, the youngest Rioja because it hasn't had time to you know, develop some tannins, but uh, a Rioja with some age on it is great with uh, you know, anything you know, that you would grill in the red meat uh, category. And uh, you know, depending on your predilections, uh, Christmas is a fun time to maybe uh, bust out that bottle of, you know, sweet wine that wouldn't necessarily usually be your, your go-to, but you know, if you get a, a half bottle of, it's probably one of the, I mean, Chateau de Cam, not included, that's extra, extraordinarily expensive, even in a half bottle, but there's some French dessert wines that are, you know, really respected that are not super expensive, or you could go the Moscato route, which is always uh, refreshing. So um, we're gonna probably have some of that Bordeaux on Christmas, but we also have discovered, the world has discovered this before as the project started in 2015. One of our favorite breweries, um, Three Floyds in Indiana, did a collaboration with a uh, Danish brewer to open up a, uh, a brew pub in Copenhagen. And they are no longer working together, but uh, Three Floyd still contracts a couple of breweries in Indiana to make this. They don't make it in their own place, but it's a, uh, it's a lager. It's called Salmon Pants, and it is just wonderful. And this is something you could, you know, it's, it's a lager, but you could still, you know, pork, ham, any of those things would taste really awesome with. And nose is really fresh, yeasty, bready kind of typical lager characteristics. And then it's very hoppy, which is typical of their style. But uh, yeah, there's some, there's no fruit additives, but you're getting kind of like a, a little nectarine, tangerine thing going on there alongside the breadiness and some, let's say some, some herbal notes here. If you think about the sort of hard scrabble herbs that grow in shot enough to pop, which I was thinking about today, probably very few other people were. The Garrigue it almost has that uh, quality, even though it's uh, made in this country. So that's an alternative uh, choice for your, your Christmas feast. Uh, there are a few uh, walls that in there, but uh, I think you were still able to uh, talk a little bit about mushrooms and Christmas wine and beer selections. Thank you so much for tuning in to Cooking with Big Mark.